Oh, you sound good, church. Good to sing together, to be able to pray together, be able to study the Word together. And I'm so excited that our classes are getting going again. And uh, let me say, if you are not part of one of the Bible classes, you really need to uh, change that because we have excellent Bible class teachers. Uh, excited to hear that we're going to be starting up new classes on Sunday mornings. And so uh, get yourself down here at 930 and get yourself to Bible class. You'll be so glad you did. Come on Wednesday night at 7 and come to Bible class. And you will be grateful that you have. We have very good classes. Our teachers put a lot of effort and energy into it. They enjoy teaching. And uh, you can really tell by the way that they present that. So make sure that you do that. I want to mention another source. I have my Bible. Uh, BibleTalk.tv shirt on that uh, uh, represents BibleTalk.tv. Mike Mazzalongo was the one that started BibleTalk.tv many years ago. He has struggled some in his health, but he is feeling better. I talked to him last night and uh, asked him if he would come and talk. He hasn't been here in a while, but he is going to come. He said he can come on the 24th on that evening which is three weeks from now, and so I want to encourage you to be here for that. That is a great work. If you haven't looked that up, BibleTalk.tv is a great resource of classes, of sermons, of devotionals. And so hop on that website when you get a chance. I have a, a class on there, my Reaching New Levels of Faith class is on there. And the, the first class has over 40,000 views, which is astounding to me. I've been teaching Reach New Levels of Faith faith for over 30 years. I've not taught it to 40,000 people, and it's been on, on their website for seven weeks, and 40,000 people have jumped on and watched that class. So it is a tremendous work. It is reaching a lot of people in a very positive way, and so uh, make sure that you look that up. Your outline is upside down in your bulletin, so pull it out and turn it over. Uh, they didn't get it put in there right, but the first class that we're going to be talking about, our first sermon is going to be embracing generosity. And so make sure that's on top. Imitating God's generos generosity is what we're going to talk about this evening. I got in the habit of years ago of uh, teaching two sermons, morning and evening, that are equally important. And I do that for a reason, because I really want you to come back to evening service. I was talking to a brother one time, and uh, I asked him, just point blank, I said, how come you never come on Sunday evenings? He says, oh, you know, it's not that I don't like your sermons. He says, I really like your sermons. Uh, I love worshiping. I just, I, I just don't want to come back to hear the same sermon twice. I said, I don't preach the same sermon twice. He says, oh, you didn't? I thought you did. I, the church I went to before, that's what the preacher did. He just preached the same sermon again in the evening. And it's like, no, no, I don't do that. And so uh, it will be different. It will be along the same topic, but it will actually kind of complete some things that I'm just going to introduce this morning as I talk about embracing generosity. I'm going to teach you what generosity is today. I'm going to show you what the Bible says that it is, and we're going to look at uh, probably the best example in the Bible of generosity in Mark chapter 12. You can be turning there. But when I'm done, I don't want you to shake hands with generosity. I don't want you to pat it on the back. I want you to embrace it. I want you to listen to this example and say, yes, that's what I need in my life. That's what I want to become. I want to be known as a generous person. So let me ask you this before we get into it. Do you have that reputation already? Maybe you do, and God bless you if you do. But if I ask several people around you, do you think so-and-so is a generous person? Would they say, oh, yeah, they are? Or would they say, are you kidding? You know, <laughs> no way. Uh, generosity is a godly quality that every Christian should have. If we're going to strive to be like Jesus, he was generous. Some would say to a fault, although I, I question the, uh, the logic of that, how you can be generous to a fault. And when you understand what generosity is, generosity is wanting to do right by all people. 
It is selflessness. It is putting others first in everything you do. Uh, normally we think about giving, and we are going to talk about giving today, but it's, it's far more than that. To be a generous person means that you, you care. As you're turning there to uh, chapter 12 of Mark, if you're not there already, and we'll get into our first point here in just a second, Jesus was frequently in the temple. We forget that Jesus was a Jew. As he was introducing Christianity, he was Jewish. He grew up in a Jewish home. He was practicing Judaism, and he would frequently go down to the temple there in Jerusalem. Many times he was teaching. Many times there would be people around him and he would be instructing them. But in Mark chapter 12, he's not teaching. What he's doing is he's sitting and he's watching. He's in the court of women is what we call it, the outer court. And in the court of women, there were 13 upside-down trumpets. They're, they're kind of metal uh, vases, I guess is how you would describe them. And that's what they would use to collect money. People would go by, and if they wanted to make a free will offering, they would put that in one of these trumpets. And the reason that they were shaped where they were narrow at the top and wider at the bottom is because it made more noise when you put the money in. And people were more likely to give because they liked that, that sound. It's like, you know that little thing at the, uh, that you see uh, sometimes in the mall that you put your, your coin in and it rolls right around until it goes down in the hole? Why do you keep doing that? Because you like to watch it roll around, around, around until it goes down in the hole. You don't even think about it. You're not getting that out again, you know, but you, know, you just love doing that, and so you just keep doing it. Well, that was kind of the same principle here. They loved the noise as their, their coins would, would chingle as it would go down inside of these trumpets. So that's the background of Mark chapter 12. We see in verse 31 that says, And he, this is Jesus, sat down opposite the treasury... And he began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury, and many rich people were putting in large sums. So point number one, and we're just going to look at text first. We'll get to takeaways in a little while, but just looking at text, number one, Jesus was watching people give. And what does that tell us? Generosity is something that Jesus watches for. Just kind of picture that. He's not teaching. His disciples were with him. We'll find that out here in a minute. But basically, he's just sitting there and just kind of studying things. And he's just watching. And he's watching the giving. Why would he do that? Because generosity is important to Jesus. He's just watching these people go by, and they're putting in their money. And some of them are putting in large sums of money. But that did not impress Jesus. It impresses us. You know, when this, this number down here at the bottom, when that's big, we say, oh, well, well, that's great. And it is great because that goes to a good work, a good cause. But it wasn't amounts of money that really impressed Jesus. People were giving large sums. It's okay, that's cool. You know, I'm glad they're doing that. But it didn't really uh, perk his interest all that much. Number two, Jesus noticed a person, though, that nobody else was paying attention to in verse 42. It says, a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which amounts to a cent. Eddie gave an explanation of, of how small. It would be equivalent to somebody coming up and putting a, a penny in the offering. You know, something that, that I found uh, walking to the church building today. I, I see pennies all the time. I, I pick them up. Not, they're hardly even valuable enough to pick up. I mean, I get more excited when I find like a, a, a nut or a bolt or something. Those are worth more, right, than a penny. But, but yeah, it, it just a penny, just putting in a penny. We, we wouldn't think anything about that. But Jesus, Jesus noticed this woman. She's a widow. And not only is she just a widow, she is a poor widow, it says in this verse, verse 42, and it's going to say it again in the next verse. Take note of that. She's not just a widow. She is a poor widow. Number three, 
Jesus, as I said, wasn't really teaching, but he's taking advantage of a teachable moment. And so verse 43 says, calling his disciples to him, he said, truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the con contributors to the treasury. And so just uh, picture the scene there. Jesus is watching this giving, and he's just seeing the people go by. And here comes a, a widow, a poor widow that nobody else even notices. She puts in something so ig insignificant, it, it probably didn't even make a noise. And Jesus says, hey, guys, come here, come here. You see that woman right there? She just put in more than anybody else. And I'm sure they're like... She did? <laughs> really? That was more? This woman put in more, it says. And Jesus said this widow gave not just more than anyone else, but she really was giving more than all of them combined. Because as we're going to find out, they're giving out of their plenty. She is giving a true sacrifice. She is making a sacrifice to put in what she is putting in. We see number four that generosity is measured by the sacrifice of the giver. Look at verse 44 with me. For they all put in out of their surplus, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she owned, all that she had to live on. So what impressed Jesus? It wasn't the amount of the money put in the plate. It was the amount of the heart of the person who was giving the gift. And the sacrifice that she made. She put in all that she had to live on. I want you to just think a little bit about what kind of faith that took. Imagine that you've got your last two pennies. <laughs> that's all you, just two pennies to rub together. And that's all you got to live on. And you are thinking, what is the best thing that I could do with this money? And you think, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go down to the temple and I'm going to put this in the treasury. Would that be your thought? Or would your thought be, I'm sure God understands if I, if I go and buy the last little bit of food that I can before I starve to death. That would probably be more our thought. But this woman did not do that. She put it to the Lord. She gave that to the Lord. And it impressed Jesus that she would do this. I have here in your notes here, if there is no cost involved is it really a sacrifice <laughs> there was a time in second samuel chapter 24 where david messed up he counted the people he wasn't supposed to count the people we don't know why he counted the people pride maybe uh, putting his security in the wrong places but it made god mad and god sent the the prophet gad to david he says uh, david you messed up and so uh, we could send uh, 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 a, a famine, seven years of famine if you want, or we can have your enemies attacking you, or, or three days of, of just a, a, a bad plague. Which would you prefer? And made David decide. Well, the plague is what they got. It was horrific. And 70,000 people died. Because of David's arrogance and his mistake. The angel of death stopped at Aaron, at, uh, at the threshing floor of Aaron, the Jebusite. And so David came to Gad. He said, what do I need to do? He says, you need to go to that threshing floor where that angel of death has stopped. And you need to offer a sacrifice. So that's what David did. He went to. And when he got there, Aaron was, I mean, this is the king coming to see him. He was so excited. And uh, he said, King David, what are you doing here? He says, well, I need to make a sacrifice. And so I, I, I need your threshing floor. I'm going to buy it. And, and Aaron says, buy it. No, listen, it's yours. You just take it. And here's, a, here's oxen to sacrifice and here's the wood and everything and David says stop 
That's not going to work. And he says, and let me put the verse up here for you, verse 24. He says, no, I will surely buy it from you for a price, for I will not offer burnt sacrifices to the Lord my God, which cost me nothing. You catch that? If it doesn't cost me nothing, it's not a sacrifice. If in your giving, you're not giving to the point it hurts, it's really not a sacrifice. It's really not generosity. The definition of generosity is when you're given to the point that it hurts, that it costs you something, that you have to get out of self to do this. And again, I'm talking about more than money, but it starts here. It really does. This is the best place to learn how to give. This is where I learned, is in the offering. That's where you learn how to be generous. That's, you need to learn how to be a cheerful giver here, and then you can do it in other aspects of your life. So let's, let's get into the takeaways here. What do we learn from this text? Well, number one, it's not the size of the gift, but the size of the heart in the giver that pleases God the most. You know, in order for you to truly embrace this whole generosity thing, and that's what I want you to do, I want you to embrace it. I want you to take this in and say, this is who I'm going to become. You first have to relinquish your own selfishness. To be a liberal giver, you first have to decide self does not come first. And parents, teach this to your children. Teach them at a young age to give and to learn how to do so joyfully. Especially if it's with their own money. That's the best way to do it. They make some money, they mow the lawn, they take out the trash, whatever they do. Get some money. Show them how to set aside a part and say this first part, you really should give that to the Lord. And they're not going to understand that at first. They're going to say, man, I could buy a lot of candy with that. <laughs> no, explain. Here's why we give it to the Lord. Here's the good that it does. First of all, you wouldn't have been able to make any of it were it not for the Lord. God has blessed you with all of it. And so the offering is just an expression of love back to God, saying, I want to give you a portion here. I want to give back this portion to say, I love you, God. And here's my expression of that. The, the, we think about money in such a worldly way, and we do it such a disservice because we don't think about it the right way. You know, unbelievers, they handle money in a particular way, right? There's a way that they use money. And if the way they use money is no different than the way that you use money, what does that tell you? Really, what does that tell you? We should not think about money or use money different, uh, the same way as the world. It should be different to us because of our faith, because of our belief in God. We approach it as a different animal than what the world thinks of it as. Number two, this example is in God's word because people erroneously believed back then as we still do today that generous is something you become after you get money i used to think that well after i'm making that six digit salary then god yeah then i'll start being generous no it doesn't take money it takes a decision of your heart that this is what i'm going to do you start today, whether you're rich or poor or whatever you are, you can start today becoming and staying a generous person the rest of your life. I'm saying you can embrace this right now. Third takeaway. Giving as a weekly part of your worship is the first place to learn generosity. As I mentioned, this is really where I learned it. It was when I, I became a Christian, when I was in my 20s, and, and I didn't really understand the whole giving thing, but I was reading the Bible, and I was trying to, and I was talking to people about it. You know, the first time that I put money in the plate, now I, I, I had kind of a, a sorted background, and I, I, I did a lot of things uh, in my college days I wish I hadn't of, but I used to think, how much should I put in the offering? I thought, well... If I was still drinking, here's how much I would be blowing on the weekend. I'll put that in the offering. That's, that's kind of how I figured it out. Okay? And that's where I started. And then I, I learned a little more mature way about doing that. 
And I, I learned about maybe giving more on a percentage. I learned that from the Old Testament practice of tithing. Okay? Not that we're commanded to tithe in the New Testament. We're not. But uh, the, if you give on a percentage of your income, then as your income increases, your giving can increase. And so it's just a good way to do it. Think about that. If you're not giving on, uh, based on a percentage, it's a good way to, to, uh, to determine how much you're going to give. It needs to be the first that you give. That needs to come out first. Uh, a tithe is not a tenth. That's a misunderstanding. It's the first tenth. That's really what it is. It is your first fruits of what you give. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we have an example here where Paul had told the churches in Macedonia that back in Jerusalem, they're going through a famine and they're starving. And the Macedonians were saying, well, we want to help. We want to do something. And Paul said, no, listen, y'all are, you're poor enough already. You, you don't need to be helping them. And they begged Paul for the opportunity to give. And verse 2 of chapter 8 says that in the great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed with a wealth of liberality. They gave to help the brethren back in Jerusalem. And by the way, a lot of those brethren were, some of them were saying, you Macedonians, we're not even sure you should be part of the kingdom. You haven't been circumcised. I mean, they, that's the same group, and they want to help them out. And they gave, and they gave liberally. Verse 5 says, and this, not as we expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. I've thought a lot about what that expression means. They first gave themselves to the Lord. I really what, think what he's saying is they didn't take away from their regular offering. Above and beyond that, they gave an amount to help with the famine in Jerusalem. They gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us. This is the will of God. Because they were being generous. Your offering is a great place to learn how to give, but it really needs to be, that needs to come off first. Let me show you another verse here in 2 Chronicles chapter 31, talking about the tithing, and they've just been commanded, you need to give this tithe, and here's what it's for, and it says in verse 5, as soon as the old order spread, the sons of Israel provided in abundance the first fruits of the grain, new wine, oil, honey, and of all the produce of the field, and they brought in abundantly the tithe of all. It needs to be the first. If you're visiting, by the way, and you think maybe, oh, this is one of those churches where they talk about money every week, <laughs> I assure you we don't. But we do talk about it because this is part of our offering. This is part of our worship to God. Our giving is just as important as the singing, as the prayer, as the taking of the supper, the preaching of the word. Each of these things that we do make up our acts of service, our acts of worship to God. Your giving is a part of that. And it is supposed to be an expression of your love for God. But if the way you're going about your giving is, well, we've got to get all of our bills paid. And then at the end, whatever is left over, then we'll give it to the Lord. Guess what? If your budget's like mine... Nothing's going in the plate. No, that, your, your budget's upside down. Okay? You need to turn that around. That needs to come off first. That goes to the Lord. Now, uh, let's see what God can do with the rest of this, you know, rather than what I can do with all of it. You will never regret doing that. I have never regretted writing that offering check. I am a cheerful giver. I love giving. It's the only check I enjoy writing. I, I might point that out. The others I couldn't care less about. But that one, I like to write. Because I know where it's going to. It's going to God. And it is, it is the way that I'm saying back to God, I love you, God. And I want to be a generous person. I want to embrace this whole thing of generosity. Are you a good tipper? When you go to a restaurant, are you generous in your 
acts of kindness to other people? Are you generous in your words of kindness to other people? Are you a generous person? One last point here, and then we'll close out. You don't need more money to be generous. What you need is more faith. Now let's go back to our example of this lady, this poor widow. She comes and she puts in everything that she has to live on. What happened after that? We don't know. In your mind, I'm sure you've read this passage before, what scenario have you played out in your mind? Well, on the way home, she won the lottery or somebody gave her a bunch of money and, and uh, she got blessed financially. We're going to look at some scriptures this, this evening and I'm going to show you just because you are generous financially doesn't mean God's going to prosper you financially. That is a false teaching. We don't know what happened to her. He, she may have gone home and, and died. But if she did, I know where she went. I know what happened next. So it wasn't a loss. We've got to stop thinking about money in such a worldly way. Money is a tool that God uses to show you, to teach you lessons about life. And if, you, if I can convince you to embrace this whole thing of generosity, to become a generous person, you're going to learn what Jesus meant when he says it is more blessed to give than to receive. That's a blessing to receive. Have you ever had anybody do something really nice for you, maybe buy your lunch or, or get you something? Isn't that nice? You secret sisters, you give each other the gifts. and I think that's a wonderful thing. I wanted to be in secret sisters. They won't let me do it. So. We're gonna, Daniel and I said we're going to start our own group. What, what are you going to call it? Brothers you know. Instead of secret sisters, brothers you know. We just give each other the gift. Yeah. I like that idea. Okay. But being generous, when, you love it when somebody's generous to you. Have you ever tried being generous to somebody else? It's a greater experience, I assure you. It is better than receiving. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. That's what Jesus said, and he ought to know. He was the greatest giver of all. Are you a generous person? Yeah, God has been generous to you. And I really hope you'll be back at 6 as we're going to talk more about this. As we talk about God and imitating God's generosity. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 says we are to be imitators of God. Well, how generous is God? Well, God is so generous that even when he didn't have to, he sent his son to this earth as a sacrifice, a selfless sacrifice for you who did not deserve it so that you might have a way to be saved. And when you believe in God and you repent of your sins and you allow yourself to be immersed in the waters of baptism, all those sins can be washed away, generously washed away. You can be redeemed. And that opportunity is yours this morning. When we sing our song of invitation, maybe you want to do that this morning. Maybe you've already done that, but you've been convicted by some things in the Bible, and you realize I'm not the person I need to be, and I need prayers of this church. This invitation is for you as well. Whatever your need, please come as we stand and sing.